So we must start. And I am um, truly happy to introduce you today's keynote speaker, Professor Lotte Tarka from, from un the University of Helsinki. Lotte is professor of folkloristics there, and uh, the Finnish School of Folkloristics is just legendary. So I have in my hand uh, Lotte's book, Lotte's monographs, titled Songs of the Border People, Genre, Ref Reflexivity, and Performance in Karelian Oral Poetry. And I, am, I think I'm not wrong if I say that Lotte's biggest love has been the Kalevala metric songs. Um, of course, other genres dealing with, with uh, beliefs of Finnic peoples. And um, I think that the main keywords of today's lecture will be um, relations beyond poetical text, um, relation through imagination, things like that. And much more things, of course. So, a lot there, please. What is there? What is here? What's beyond? And what is not? Where am I? Who am I? And who are you? I don't know, and few of us do. In mythology, these questions are answered by telling tales, or by turning questioning, answering, and narration into ritual practices. Both narratives and rituals are symbolic action that involves imagination, an orientation from the here and now to times, spaces, and entities that are unknown or beyond perception. In symbolic action, imagination does not start where knowledge ends and the senses don't reach. It enables knowledge production, interpretation, and relating the sensory to conceivable and relatable entities. In this paper, I will deal with the interface of poetics and religion. Coming from folklore studies, I will discuss the heuristic potential of the notion of imagination in the study of verbal art and performance. I hope that this will also have some relevance to the study of religion. I propose that there is methodological sense in relating the concepts of tradition and imagination. The focus is on verbalized and performatively efficient vernacular imagination that is communicated in mythic images and mythic narratives. My point is that in order to ease the dichotomies of the collective and individual mythos and logos, sense and sensibility, or permanence and variation, one not only needs imagination, one needs the notion of imagination. So in order to conceptualize oral mythologies and probably also other religious corpora, one has to take imagination seriously. It is never just my imagination. I work on Finnic uh, pre-modern mythology, archival texts, that is, documented and transcribed oral traditions. These texts convey messages of action and communicative practices of people who are temporally and geographically distant from us. They are the others. In their mythic traditions, these others performed to each other things that they had imagined in their minds. The imaginary is embodied in words, writes Jacques Le Goff, when the processes of imagination and their cultural expressions, or imaginaries, are put into words and verbalized, they enter the intersubjective reality. In performance, they may also turn into sounds and body movements, or materialize as objects. But today I will only talk about words. When imaginations become social facts and representations, the conventions of, conventions of expression start to mold and restrict the imaginal. Simultaneously, these very same conventions enable the operation of imagination. Conventional formulae and patterns create ever new couplings and multiply 
the potential of meaning creation. The link between convention or tradition and imag imagination makes it possible to verbalize the unforeseen, but this can only happen by referring to what has already been seen and said before. The processes of imagination and deciphering its verbalizations thus presuppose competence in the culture's texts and imageries. Imagination is inseparable from tradition, language, and also genres of expression. This is particularly salient in conventionalized and crystallized expressive languages, such as folklore, but it applies similarly to cultural improvisations. Talking about imagination always implicates some sort of reality, something that is out there for real. My reality will be a historical one. It is no more, but it was once. I'm dealing with Karelia, or especially Vienna Karelia, in the 19th century, and especially the tradition of oral poetry practiced there, the Kalavala Mater songs or the Runo song. These poems were performed on wide areas in Finland and Karelia up until the Second World War, and they were for the most part documented by Finnish folklorists during the uh, 19th century. The Runa song is the most significant source for the study of Finnic, uh, uh, Finnish Karelian mythology and folk belief. The mythic narrative poems, as well as the ritual charms and incantations, offer an insight into the ways in which the users of this poetry conceptualized humanity, temporality, spatiality, and the realms beyond all of these. Mythology and poetry are both marked discourses, and they are also authoritative discourses charged with intense meanings. In both, the messages conveyed and the language used differ from the everyday ones. Both are essentially conventional, but also imaginative and creative. In both, the language, language is metaphoric, an essence that, according to Paul Ricoeur, also characterizes imagination. Ricoeur's approach to imagination does not define it in relation to perception and mental images, but as a specific way of language use. Imagination is a source of semantic innovation, and it operates by creating novel couplings between semantic or conceptual fields in metaphoric processes that create radically new meanings. Poetic and mythic language also shows, shows the unspeakable, the unseen, and the inexplicable in concrete images as something tangible, understandable, and graphic. At the same time, this language places the everyday and apparent realities in new contexts, simultaneously blurring and questioning conventional and routinized meanings. The operating force in this questioning and creation of meaning is the imagination. Rather than answering explicitly the questions I started with, I will try to unveil how cosmogonical narratives, notions of the other world, and utopian discourse were elaborated upon in poetic language and ritual practice. How is the imagination operating in these poetic and cognitive processes? What kind of processes, entities, and agencies are involved in these narratives? In the study of Kalevalamita poetry, imagination has been a residual category described in unanalytic metaphors. Imagination is a limitless kingdom that flies and waves free and vast. In the context of romantic nationalism, there was no need for ancient, there was a need for ancient heroic history, but imagination was not needed, nor imagination or uh, mythology. Imagination was also an obstacle uh, to reconstructing the history of the nation through folk poetry, because it distorted the original ancient meanings. There are several reasons for the suspicious attitude towards the imaginal. At the bottom lies a rigid notion of tradition. In the history of folklore studies, the creativity of individual subjects and imagination were long seen as diametrically opposed and even detrimental to the idea of collective tradition. Tradition was old stuff. 
new stuff was never tradition. The invention of the new was the domain of imagination, as in the creation or conjuring up of something unforeseen, such as imaginary words or chimeras. In this academic tradition of Finnish study of folklore and folk belief, the biased notion of imagination has had three facets. First, imagination has been treated as creativity that gives birth to poetry. So we are dealing with art here. Rather than being a characteristic of all people, creativity was a talent of the few, the chosen of ancient bards or the obscure Volksgeist. True imagination had existed in the ancient past, but in the present, creativity had regressed into an ability to select, combine and ornament. Real people simply had no genius. Imagination was thus ambiguous. It was both the generator of poems and the impulse that made them change and depart from their original form and meaning. It caused both the birth and the death of poems. Second, imagination has been linked to the origin of mythic concepts. The ancient beliefs of other peoples were deemed to be fantasies and superstitions that is, distorted interpretations of reality. Myths were fables created by the imagination and mythic images, fairy tale constructions. Imagination thus had the same derogative and othering semantic value as the notion of myth in the history of romanticism or magic in evolution, evolutionist thinking. In particular, ideas related to nature myths, animism and personification were linked to the imagination. For example, the myth of the world pillar was based on the knowledge, on folk knowledge and proto-scientific folk observations on the immovable North Star. This core, based on em empirical world, activated the vernacular imagination and, <coughs> and finally took the shape of religious imaginings. These were further elab elaborated upon in poetry. The academic notions on nature myths were based on implicit reasoning concerning the psychology of primitive man. And they tried to link together human perception, quest to explain, ability to understand, and verbal expression. Personification and animism were seen to build on metaphor. And this leads to the third part. Imagination has been analyzed as the essence of figurative language. Metaphoric language was essential to human nature, and it generated reasonings in which the human mind applied human qualities to the environment, to other species, to the landscape, to the elements. Animistic metaphors were typically not only images, but serious notions on essential qualities. This was, in a sense, proof of primitive poetics. Sophisticated art would not have worked like this. Let me now sketch out the concept of vernacular imagination, or the cultural, collective and traditional aspect of imaginative processes that are characteristic of pre-modern, largely oral traditions. Vernacular imagination encompasses the imaginaries and the strategies of poetic language and conceptual thinking that produce use and vary upon these imageries. Because imagination and imaginaries are bound to language, expressive traditions and processes of memory, I argue that vernacular imaginaries, often coded in oral tradition, differ essentially from those of literary cultures. That is why I will talk about vernacular, not any imagination. I'm building on a, revis uh, on a revision of uh, Annalena Siikala's seminal study uh, mythic Images and Shamanism from 1992, in which she develops her theory on mythic metaphors. Building on Paul Ricoeur, George Lakoff, and Mark Johnson, Siegel defines metaphors as descriptions of, phenomenon, of a phenomenon through something that represents a different conceptual category. Metaphors enable linguistic innovation and speech about things that would otherwise escape words. This indicates the imaginative and conceptual process in which the non-existent is giving meaning by linking it with various experiential and perceivable entities. 
Through mythic, mythic images, people are able to grasp the unknown and put it into a relevant frame. In the context of mythic thinking, the frame of interpretation is specific and conventional, and this sets mythic Im images apart from other imaginal processes, such as art and play. For Seekala, mythic images are decipherable only in the context of the belief tradition, and their interpretation is never sporadic or spontaneous. The meanings of mythic images can be deduced from the frame of otherworldliness, writes Seekala. By deducing the meaning of mythic images solely from the notions of the other world or the supranormal, Seekala, however, disregards one of the most dynamic and creative aspects of mythic thought. Its capacity to link the mythic realms to the human everyday life world, world historical events and life histories, such as getting lost in the woods, war, diaspora, or widowhood. Mythic discourses has this synthesizing capacity precisely because it's imaginal essence. In imagination, we are able to link mythic ideas and images to common reasoning, the serious to play, and the sacred to the profane. When cultural messages intersect in these processes, the emotive power of myths transform also other than religious spheres of activity. At the same time, the entire system of genres in the culture is activated. I will give some examples later. Both William Doty and Annalena Siegala propose that in the frame of mythic imagination, images are true experientially or considered and experienced as real, so truth and reality. Assessment and evalu evaluation of mythic imagination in terms of its truthfulness or realness echoes, albeit inversely, the antiquitarian split between mythos and logos, according to which myths represent imaginative and entertaining narration, whereas logos and history narrate the truth, are logical and transmit knowledge. The question whether mythic images are real, true, or believed in is misp misplaced. Mythic imagination owes its significance to its adjustability, elasticity, and multivalence, not the truth value or experienced realness. The first aspect of vernacular imagination is its historicity. Imagination is not uh, an ahistorical and universal faculty of the human mind. Cultural imagination and imaginaries change over time, naturally. They are historically layered and linked to the slowly changing structures of mentality. Representations organized within the sphere of vernacular imagination are seldom, do seldom form a coherent mythological whole, although variation and innovation are structured and conventional. The coherence of image frames within a mythic corpus is context-specific. The images do make sense, but the relevant meanings do not apply in any context. On the other hand, usability of images in many contexts creates coherence across these domains of use. The third quality of vernacular imagination is the tension between the collective and individual. Changing interpretations of images are not random or purely idiosyncratic. They operate at the interface of the collective sphere and individual creativity. Imagination is a social project that is made possible by individual culturally orchestrated performances and acts of interpretation. Within the scope of vernacular imagination, mythic images form powerful sites of cultural memory, emotion, and action. These are simultaneously made possible and molded within tradition. They influence the way in which individuals and communities act and dialectically change as they are shaped through this action. For example, Kathleen Lennon has emphasized the cognitive and affective implications of imaginary worlds. She says that we can only be involved in the world through imagination. 
Also, Mark Johnson links imagination to emotion and cognition. For him, imagination is a pervasive structuring activity by means of which we ach achieve coherent, patterned, unified representations. It is indispensable for our ability to make sense of our experience, to find it meaningful. Imagination is absolutely central to human rationality, that is, to our rational capacity to find significant connections, to draw inferences, and to solve problems. Lastly, vernacular imagination is characterized by the dynamic interplay of tradition and creativity, or in Paul Ricoeur's terms, the dialectic of sedimentation and innovation, or in the spirit of this conference, continuities and disruptions. As stated before, the contrast of these was essen essential in the problematic notion of imagination in early folklore studies. Acts of creation and innovation were restricted to the first folklore performances, where the genius bard made up the poem. After that, this poem was simply replicated and conserved, or contaminated and muddled. Even if imagination could affect the degree of faithful replication, it was never truly creative. Only the reassessment of competence, performance, and composition in performance starting in the 1970s, gave the conceptual tools for understanding all folklore performances as creative. Now there is a consensus on creativity and originality as the primary aspects in every performance. Imagination thus characterizes tradition during its entire lifespan. The past performances and interpretations form sediments in the text and make tradition present in every act of creation. And now we start the empirical part. We enter Karelia to look at the human endeavor to capture and create cosmogonies, other worlds, and utopias in terms of vernacular imagination. First, I will deal with mythic narratives and images linked to the creation of the world. And secondly, I will address the idea of the other world as the vernacular symbolic negation Last, I will discuss the utopian element in mythic imaginaries. Let's start from the beginning. In 1829, a Finnish Lutheran priest, Jakob Fellman, asked a Vienna Karelian man what he considered to be the origin of the world. The old man replied, Well, my holy brother, we have the same faith as you. An eagle flew from the north, placed an egg on Wainamoinen's knee, knee, and created the world out of it. That's what you believe too, isn't it? Fellman's intriguing sketch has long been accepted <clears throat> as evidence of both the naivety of the folk and the religious relevance of Kalevala meter poetry, and es especially the song of creation that the man summarized. The encounter between the two men was inscribed by an ethnic, social, and religious divide. The old man cherished pre-modern notions of the creation, but he was also an Orthodox Christian, an old believer. Yet he called the Lutheran priest his holy brother and insisted that they have the same faith. The apparent consensus also reflects vernacular imagination. The framework of the vernacular belief system allowed for a range of different narratives. They could be parallel, analogical, and even competing. Mythic poems in the Kalevala meter challenged the cosmogony of the Christian faith, obviously, but they were, they were themselves challenged by many vernacular belief narratives. The clash of the diverse explanations involved implicit and explicit negotiation on the significance and prestige of these traditions. The genre also determined how the cosmogonies were to be understood. For example, interpretations of lunar and so solar eclipses varied radically. According to the basic idea, a thick cloud concealed the celestial bodies. This rather simple image was, however, challenged with many traditional explanations. For example, a belief legend explained that the Virgin Mary had such thick hair 
that when she stepped in front of the sun, it ceased to shine. The mythic pre-modern poem in the Kalevala meter, The Great Oak, discloses another origin for the phenomenon. A giant oak tree grows to a great height and blocks the clouds and the light of the sun and the moon. These images of a darkening sky were used in lyric and epic poems to, to depict various states of distress. All these narratives and their symbolic uses represent the poetic contaminations that the nature myth theorists mentioned when discussing the origin of mythic ideas. They show how the idea of darkness and unexpected astronomical events were visualized as something caused by a particular anthropomorphic being, such as Virgin Mary, or a plant. In both explanations, it is the unlimited growth of hair or branches that causes the blockage of light. Both stories also as was, were also associated with emphatic moral messages. So not even the deepest origins, syvimmat synnyt, as it was expressed, they're definite. And they also varied from village to village and from family to family. The Karelian man who was willing to share his cosmogony with Felman was probably aware of several Kalevala meter poems on or allusions to the origins of the universe. In the creator's hymn built on vernacular orthodox legends, the moon and the sun identified themselves as creations of the Christian God. Other mythic motives refer to a gr group of pre-Christian creator heroes who had forged the heavens and put the heavenly bodies on their place, on their rightful places. The different versions illustrate the stratified context and genre-specific nature of vernacular mythology, its variation and its flexibility. Etiologies were mostly presented in incantations in which the origin of the object of the incantation was disclosed. Origin of the fire, origin of iron, origin of several diseases, etc. But what about the narratives of creation? How and out of what was everything created? The concrete nature of vernacular imagination rules out creation out of nothing, ex nihilo. It is precisely the act of imagining that replaces and fills the idea of nothingness into something tangible. The egg, discussed before, is a good example. In the mythic world of the Song of Creation, the hero who created the universe out of this egg inhabited a world in which he already pursued diverse tasks. The world was already there. But this was not a logical, philosophical, narrative, or aesthetic problem. Few things just emerged. They took shape, moved from one place to another, transformed, and were worked on. The processes and acts of creation within the mythic narrative world are many. First, there is the possibility of metamorphosis. An animal or plant may bring forth metamorphosis for example, eggs may turn into celestial bodies. Or a god or a culture hero may bring forth a metamorphosis using, for example, his or someone else's body parts and fluids. The serpent is born out of Judas's vomit. Second, things come into being as a product of godly craftsmanship. Supernatural often male and anthropomorphic agents take action. They can mold the natural environment, for example, hammer the sky and nail the stars. Or they can construct objects out of diverse materials. Strings for the first musical instrument were created out of the death maiden's hair and a pike's jawbone. Or the heroes can find a monstrous opponent, for example, kill a giant fish, and release the spark for the first fire from its belly. The third alternative is birth in the more or less biological sense. 
Anthropomorphic females are impregnated by natural forces and give birth to beings or personified things. The most typical impregnator in Kalevala meter poetry is the wind. A maiden is lying on the shore with her back against the wind and gets pregnant. After the birth, the offspring is baptized and given, given, given a place in the cosmic order. It is clear, however, that giving birth does not bring into existence anything good or essential. Only problems such as diseases or beasts of prey. Jesus is the only ex uh, exception. Jesus was born after Mary gets pregnant by a lingonberry. The fourth option for emerging is growth. One of the most remarkable mythic poems in the Kalevala meter relates the origin of abundance and scarcity. The mythic source of all that is good, harvest, salt, commodities, words, wisdom, is prepared by the mythic smith at the beginning of time. This source, called the Sambo, is a problematic object. It is a man-made machine, but it grows organically. It has roots and it produ produces limitless good. This process of growth that also brings forth totally new emergent qualities may be viewed also as a metamorphosis in which a man-made object is animated and starts a life of its own. It is also a product of craftsmanship, so a very hybrid creature to be born. Lastly, one can also be born by movement. One of the simplest ways to portray the emergence of something that did not exist before is representing it as an arrival. Something comes from the other world and is thus born. This applies to the idea of human birth. The womb is portrayed as a dark and narrow otherworldly space, and the baby is portrayed as a traveler who passes through an arduous journey. journey. The bear descends from the heaven. The water bird, or the eagle, or the bee fly from over the seas, from beyond the horizon, to lay eggs or bring honey for anointment. All these categories of creation may combine. Creation often must, has many stages or aspects. It is a hybrid process, as the sample showed us. The remarkable trait is in common is the relaxed attitudes towards emergence. Often the emergent entity, as if existed already in another dimension, it just had to be fetched, brought into the daylight, as it were. The agents involved could be forces or semi-abstract essences, but mythic narratives and ritual addresses demanded that they be described as agent and partners in communication. This is not only a matter of personification, but also a necessity of poetics of narration. The question of imagining the times before times and beings before being is also a matter of narrating them. The spatial aspect of emergence is also notable. What, what or where was the place out of which entities and beings emerged? Where did they come from? Acts and processes of creation took place where the existent borders on the non-existent. The poetic strategies and imaginative processes addressing this are related to the category of the other world. In 1971, Mihkali Pertunen, a singer from Vienna Karelia, performed his version of the Song of Creation, in which the mythic hero Väinämöinen drifts across the primordial sea. After creating the world out of the egg, Väinämöinen shapes the bottom of the sea and the coastline, and then drifts to the shore of Northland, Pohjola. To an audience familiar with a poetic corpus, already the mention of Northland activates a broad spatio-temporal semantic framework rooted in the other world. It is clear that the events of primordial time are situated on the border of the two worlds, our world and that of the other. 
It was on these border zones that things not only emerged, they also vanished, broke down, died and decomposed. Michali gives the following account on Väinämöinen's journey, and I will recite it in Karelian. You may read the English translation. Häntä tuuli tuuvittaue ilman lieto liikuttaue, oalto rannalla ajaue, pimiä on pohjoilla he, tarkkahan tapioilla he, miehien syöjä hän kylä he, urohon upottaja he, kiven kirjavan sivulla, puajen paksun lappialla, suorehen selällise he, mantere on puuttoma he. The narrative world of Kalavalamita poetry is filled with similar depictions of journeying to the other world. It is a destination too strange to picture by means of normal expressive strategies. In the face of the challenge, the singer slows down and by repetition creates a cross exposure of the ultimate dystopia. How did Mihkali relate and picture the unknown? What did he, a blind man, see in his mind's eye? The other world was dark and peculiarly strict, strangely colored, but still natural in its stone likeness. It was a barren island surrounded by water, a village which consumed and drowned heroes. The other world's normalcy comes with a twist. In taming and familiar familiarizing the unknown, Mihkali brought concrete and everyday landscape features, such as islands, social organizations such as villages, and elements such as water, into contact with perpetually new and surprising image frames. The familiar meanings of the features and elements of this landscape receded and were contested, but the unknown was covered with images and meanings. The counterintuitiveness of the colorful stone compelled reflection on the categories and characteristics of stones and colors of villages, continents and waters, of drowning and floating. Mikkeli's performance is the result of contextually relevant selection. He combined elements from the pool of traditional expressions in order to form a meaningful and aesthetically pleasing whole. The paradigmatic set of usable expressions was based on the singer's mastery of the mythic corpus, or the mythic imaginary. The combination of these elements into a syntagmatic whole in performance presupposed competence in the poetic idiom and narrative structure, here especially the aesthetic and structural norms of parallelism. These patterns are essential to the operation of vernacular poetic imagination. One of the most typical epithets describing the other world points to its otherness and oddity. To start with, it can be described, for example, as a region or a building with its particular paths and doors. The epithets used to particularize these spatial entities referred to their unknown quality. The land was foreign, unknown, strange, nameless, senseless and secret. Such epithets not only identified something as unknown, they also indexed danger or, for example, ritual impurity. Already this negative identification, or the acknowledgement of knowing that something is ultimately unknown, eliminated at least some of the danger. Speaking of the other world fills the unknown dimensions of reality with images, giving, it, giving them form and substance. The source of these images is naturally in the familiar reality that can be ob observed and understood. One way of solving the problem of depicting the other world is the use of negations, indicating the absence of features that characterize reality. Obviously, even a tentative understanding of the negative requires imagination, the ability to grasp also that which is not. Now, metaphors portray the other world effectively. We tend to describe a phenomenon that escapes words by using features of the known and familiar. Negations and metaphors are prerequisites for the verbalization of the other world. Through them, that which is not and that which is not known 
is brought into existence at the level of language. As performatives, the negative assertions become strategic parts of social reality. So other world epithets make use of the imagination in projecting features of the known and familiar universe onto the unknown, indicating, however, the absence of these characteristics. The same mental and linguistic images used to describe the other world aid our understanding of the world we know, or we think we know. Other world imagery lays bare and simplifies the structures, characteristics, and values of the observable reality. In vernacular imagination, the conceptual procedures connected to the other world applied to any attempt at capturing existential, social, or cultural otherness. And it probably also works like this in our society. Then my last empirical example. In his theory of myth, Paul Ricoeur stresses the charged duality of myth. It is a social imaginary that anchors the community in its past, but also propels it towards the future. Myth always has an utopian element, and in its utopias, the society expresses its hopes and its potentials. But not only that, in its ideological function, myth all myth also reinforces the formative symbols of the society. Even if the other world is basically a spatial category, it has two temporal dimensions. The mythic time before time and the space-time of the afterlife. Both of these dimensions are absent but still highly significant. Utopia is a spatial temporal concept too. It is a non-place that is not here, at least yet. The utopian representations, however, always hint at their potential actualization. As Senni Timonen has noted in the context of Kalevala meter lyric poetry, utopian images turn away from what is present and begin to strive for the imagined. Just as the notions of the other world, utopian discourse creates new, alternative universes. It, it explores the potentialities of existence that, like the other world, are linked to a dialectic assessment of everyday reality. Like negations, utopian images express the characteristically human inclination to turn from what is present towards what is absent. But unlike images of the other world, utopian discourse relates to something better than this life. Utopia makes the impossible into a reality. It extends the real, writes Timonen. In 1911, Anni Lehtonen, a runo singer from Vienna Karelia, sang a lyric poem on her widowhood. She had learned the song in her childhood from her mother, who used to sing it while they were fishing. Mother and daughter were later both widowed, Anni at the age of 39, 38. Anni starts her song by describing her longing in physical terms. Then she sings about the adversities of her orphaned children and herself. The image is resigned and inconsolable and portrays a cold and windy underworldly landscape of loss. But then something happens. She evokes the idea of a potent god who can change it all. And now you will have to imagine the two woman, women in a boat, rowing, mother and daughter. And then some 40 years later, Anni as a, as a widow and the folklore collector. But what you will hear is a scholarly reconstruction performed by two of my colleagues, Kati Kallio and Heidi. Harpoja Mäkelä, and they will start from the middle of the song. Kyllä se voi piivo, voi paluoja, sata viisulo, o Jumala, ylentäälle, etu mieleen, nosta lasketu, Kypärän, no 
The God can turn the current state of affairs upside down. The first reversal activates the symbolic net network of ritual headgear. In Kalavala meter poetry, a helmet worn sideways pictured sorrow, loss or defeat, but it also was firmly associated with image frames of magical protection and death. The lowered helmet is likened to the sunken spirit of the ego, but this state of liminality and vulnerability could be ended by God. To convey the idea of an almighty creator, Anni presents a set of reversals. God is able to lift up the mind of the ego as he is able to lift up the hollow lowlands and push down the hill, hills. This is actually an intertextual allusion to a Lutheran hymn. This landscape of defiant hope leads to the third aspect of reversal. The God is able to turn the social hierarchies on their head by changing the roles of master and servant. The mind and identity of the ego is likened to the forms of landscape and social structure. The parallel between the couplets implies a coherent world order in which the minds, landscapes, and social statuses harmonize. The last passage is a radical departure from the Christian worldview. It presents a vernacular mythic image on the creation of the universe, one that I already mentioned. The speaker of the poem claims to have been one of the creators of the universe, or more precisely, of the uh, uh, creator of the stars and the sky above. This motif is widely used in Kalevala meter poetry, and it functions as an empowering authorization of the text and its ego. In magic incantations, it is used to raise the performer's spirit and to enable an effective ritual performance. In lyric poetry, it builds a nostalgic structure of contrasting a powerful mythic past and the destitute present. In both genres, the rhetorical aim of the motif is to show that because of his or her deeds in the mythic past, the ego of the text is entitled to a better future. Using this mythic image, Anni concludes her song with a defiant note. I used to be a man, sings Anni. Obviously, the protagonists in the myth of creation were all male, but men and women alike alluded to this myth. Ideologically, then, the notions of man and hero promote patriarchal ideology. But in the context of Anni's poem, recurs understanding of myth and imagination as dualities of ideology and utopia is highly relevant. The widow does not repeat and reinforce the norm formative symbols of the society, but uses them to express her hopes and potentials. Being able to step into the role of hero and provider was symbolically a gender reversal similar to the subversive idea of a serf taking the role of master. The landscape of defiant hope is completed with the ultimate cosmic landscape. The one who has been among the creators of this landscape is entitled to the transformation of the landscape of loss depicted in the opening of the poem. There is an overarching thematic parallelism in the juxtaposition of these landscapes. The lowlands, or the underworld of death and mourning, 
the reshaping of the high and lowlands in the climactic turn of the poem, and lastly, a concrete ascension into the celestial sphere. Here, among the potent gods, the heroine is empowered. Mythic images are emotionally, cognitively, and morally compelling representations that are authorized by relating them to tradition. The boundary between mythic and the non-mythic is a fuzzy one. Myths are able to articulate not only the cosmogonic and cosmographic frames, but also the values of the community, historical circumstances, and personal experiences. In the field of vernacular imagination, mythic elements are charged with emotions and everyday dilemmas, personality and historicity, and they thus gain an expressive and world-altering power. By means of imagination, possible worlds are created, and these potentialities may have surprising consequences for the intersubjective reality that we perceive as present for us. Let me end by turning our attention to those who imagine, in this context, the Runo singers. One of them, whom we already met, Anni Lehtonen, described the ways of her mind like this. I don't believe what the others say. My thoughts, they fly like nothing else. They fly all around the empires at one moment. This is an image of imagination, an image in the second degree. Anni verbalized it while telling that people, her neighbors, condemned her skillful runo singing as a sin that will eventually take her into hell. She didn't care she told the folklore collector. She would like to learn to read and to cast even more spells, adding to the freedom of her thoughts. The strength of her imagination could not be nullified by social control or divine punishment, nor by competing media of communication, such as the written word. Instead, the utopian image of learning how to read and write made her sing on and even louder. As a, being with the ability to to, as a being with the ability to imagine, she and those who condemned her are geniuses and bricolers in one. They create, combine, improvise, and repeat. They see images, use words, and dream. They have visions and memories, and they build utopias and nostalgic projections. They yearn for the world that is no more, and for the world to come. They fear the other, but are at the same time capable of empathy. They use their imagination to feel what it feels like to be a fellow human being, and in doing so, build bonds, communities, and societies. Imagination is at the core of humanity. Imagination extends our reality by creating images and rendering them communicable by combining them with other culturally defined and traditional images and ideas. It draws out the wordless and even subliminal from within the mind into an intersubjective reality. The figuration of other worlds and utopias in images, myths and ritual, rituals provides, to quote William Doty, opportunities to perform the world. In a performative sense, these performing acts actualize the unseen and extend the field of what exists. This process shows that the routinized everyday realities have their roots in the empirical one, but are essentially outcomes of a laborious, multi-layered mental and symbolic process. Thank you. Thank you, Lotte, for this deep and, I would say, very beautiful keynote. And now we have time for questions or comments. Thank you.
Is this on? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm a Tem Pauha. I'm a religion scholar at the University of Helsinki and also a clinical psychologist, which is why I'm making the following comment. Because the way you uh, characterized imagination very much brought to my mind the psychodynamic notion of uh, transitional space, the idea of which that uh, is that when the primary fantasy, primary omnipotent fantasies of the little child come to terms with the outer realities, a special space transitional space is born to bridge the inner and outer. And it is in this space in which play, for example, takes place because in the objects in transitional space can be both one thing and something else. For example, a teddy bear can be both alive and lifeless, lifeless object. And uh, I would very much want to hear your thoughts on this, if you have any, any reflections on, on this idea. I know that there's a huge discussion on the imagination in the field of psychology, philosophy, literature, art, you name it. Um, I think it's great that you find, found something that it touches upon your, your field in this, but I actually cannot uh, comment on that because I'm not familiar with your sort of a frame of, of thinking. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for this interesting and um, for me totally new uh, theme. I don't know anything. I didn't know anything about uh, Finnish uh, creative folklore, but uh, I, I remember that in 1950s, in the middle of the 10th century, there was a very revolutionary study of the Yugoslav folklore, of the oral poetry of Yugoslavs, which, which also influenced the study of Homeric poetry and. The uh, discovery was that uh, in Yugoslav poetry, like in Homeric poetry, there are patterns which guide uh, the author the, uh, in his creativity. There are linguistic patterns. Uh, the creative poetry is not constructed in the em empty space, but they use certain linguistic phrases. So my, my question is if there is anything similar in uh, oral uh, poetry of uh, Finnish poets, do they use linguistic patterns? Yeah, you're talking about the oral formulaic theory by Albert Lord, and, and uh, it has been applied to the study of Finnish folklore also. Uh, the, basically, the idea is that, that in order to be able to uh, compose poetry in performance, People not only need these broader narrative structures in their mind, they also need these sort of ready-made uh, packages called formulae. And uh, for example, one can call this last passage here, I too was once one of the men, etc. It is a formula. It is used widely in the, in the, uh, in the poetic corpus. And uh, there's one problem in the application of this formulaic theory into, into Kalevala meter poetry, which is that it, uh, its variation is not that uh, radical as in the, in the Yugoslavic poetry. And some of the scholars said that people actually uh, repeated quite a lot. So that is why they, there was some suspicion even to that of whether the poems are really composed in performance. But now we know that in order to be able to compose even long poems in the, in the performance, you don't have to recall it as a whole. You need the narrative structures and then these ready-made uh, formulae, which are in, in the Finnish corpus quite limited, though. They, they might be longer like this one, but then there are sort of a really short one-line phrases. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Thomas Andres Putter. Um, um, I, I would uh, like to ask a question about uh, this uh, this song, and and it's actually uh, uh, concerning the interpretation you made um, um, about this last part. I too was one once one of the men, uh, and you you, you said that uh, that uh, uh, these lines are uh, in contradiction to the Christian uh, view. Uh, was it so? 
Yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, I wonder uh, whether this kind of interpretation is uh, uh, necess uh, a necessary one, because, you know, uh, at the beginning you have this uh, kind of uh, image of the almighty creator mm -hmm. who is understood uh, uh, as the creator who is uh, almighty in his love, so mm -hmm. the sweet God. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then um, there is a, a difference, uh, so the almighty creator and then these uh, six heroes, uh, and uh, I, I, I would say, as a complete lay person in mm -hmm. your field, I would say that uh, actually here we have a kind of um, imagination of being part of uh, the emerging humanity or, mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh, so I am also part of humans, so uh, uh, part of those ones who started to, to, to name uh, the world, uh, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, at least this difference between the, the creator, the almighty who is uh, almighty in uh, uh, his or her love, and, and uh, then the kind of asymmetrical difference between this one and, and, and the six, so uh, a kind of symbol for, for uh, the emergence of uh, humankind. Thank you. That is a great interpretation. I, I've never thought that it might be sort of an allegory of, of humankind, of the humankind who is starting to name these essences. But usually the, um, the motif uh, is longer and it uh, says very explicitly that this is a motif uh, that is alluding to a longer myth that is never told as a whole, but there seems to have been uh, six male uh, culture heroes or gods who were building the universe, nailing the skies, uh, putting the stars on their places, and, and uh, fixing the, the edges of the air. So you can interpret it also as a picture of humanity and the ability to, to understand and name the cosmos and its structures, but it is also a pre-modern myth. But it can be both. And actually, I think that Anni is using it in this allegorical sense that you mentioned. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. My name is Ruth Tillman from the Donner Institute, Obo Academy University. Thank you for this lecture. I think it was very, very suitable that we had this fine presentation of, of vernacular imagination here at the University of Tartu, where so much theoretical research has been put into that explicit category of vernacular religion. And um, you gave us very good examples of what you mean with vernacular imagination, different dimensions and parts of it, but could you still say, uh, do you have a special definition of, of the term vernacular in mind when you present this research that would somehow distinguish it from other very similar concepts that might be used for the everyday or for the lived or for the, for the folk or something like this? So, so what, is, what, what do you read into the vernacular as distinct to these other similar notions? You mean uh, notions such as folk or popular, etc. Well, vernacular is, is the term that we use nowadays in order to try to avoid the old romanticist notions attached to the word folk. It, of course, has its own allusions to all kinds of power structures, but it still is a good term to indicate the, uh, the uh, spheres of culture that are not uh, dictated by the... Uh, by the institutions, by schooling, by media. And in my particular case, it is quite clear that these are uh, people who lived in a basically oral tradition, and it's, it's safe to call it a vernacular belief system because it was largely untouched by religious institutions. These people were old believers who protested fiercely against the uh, church and the churches, and they wanted to create their own kind of religiosity there. But you could also say folk imagination. Uh, some Finnish scholars have used the word popular imagination in order to distinguish this discussion from the general discussion on imagination that always talks about uh, mental images, perceptions philosophical stuff. We are talking about the cultural expressions of 
imagination. You could also talk about imaginaries. That would be maybe sort of a easier then. So thank you, Lotte. You mentioned in the beginning that you hope that there is something worthwhile for the religion scholar as well in your talk. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, besides what Ruth just asked, one thing that I found very interesting was in the last part of your presentation where you talked about the ideology of imagination mm -hmm. and referred to Annie Lehtonen's how she thought about, how she understood imagination. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, as far as I know, at least anthropologists of Christianity have uh, talked about ideolo semiotic ideology, mm. linguistic ideology, and kind of now we introduced like imaginary ideology or ideology of imagination. Can you say more about this? I mean, is it uh, have other singers phrased and elaborated on the ideas besides Annie? And 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 what do you find there? No, I think Annie. Lehtonen is the only one who has uh, explicitly commented upon her imagination, but in the, in the poems themselves there are many, many uh, things that somehow uh, talk about imaginative processes in the so-called singer's words where, where the singers tell that now they are going to start singing and what, what they will be singing about and where do the thoughts come from, where do the words come from and so on. Uh, there some notions of imagination can be found, but they are not that explicit. And they are more like um, talking about the, uh, the process of dragging words from the memory and putting them into the open air as sounds, as words, as performances. Then there, is, there are some versions of the Sampo poem that I mentioned, where this uh, miraculous machine that we saw there also produces words and, and thoughts. And I have thought that this is maybe one image of imagination where they think that uh, a structure or an object or an idea that produces everything that is good in the world, in the cosmos, it also produces the thoughts and images to our minds. That is weird and great, and it's sort of a somewhere there, scattered, but not a systematic image of imagination. So this is a rare example. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Lotte, for this very fine discussion of a very old-fashioned question. Hmm? There is such a long history of research about connecting myth and mythology with rituals, with ritual practices. And in, in your case, in discussing uh, vernacular imagination or mythic discourses. Do you see any connection at, at all? Any, any hints, any references to ritual practices? Is it the total imaginary? Or what would you say about, about this connection? I think that um, this, uh, these imaginations, they also realize or actualize in ritual action and there are some very good examples from the field of Kalevala meter poetry. For example, uh, in a ritual where uh, a wedded couple was being protected from the uh, malevolent neighbors, uh, the ritual specialist walked around the married couple uh, uh, saying, saying or performing an incantation that mentions uh, an iron uh, fence, uh, axe of fire, and um, axe of iron. And so he is verbally producing these images of very powerful entities and protective devices, but she, he is also using them. He has an axe in his hand, a burning thing in, her, in his hand and he's sort of circulating the wedded couple as a ritual act by this fence he's uh, singing about. So the mythic images are, we know already that they are reproduced also in action as acts. Yeah. They are mythic images but they actualize in ritual action. Good.
I see no more questions and we are perfectly in time now. So thank you a lot again and thank you for everybody for coming here and it's now time for lunch and fun. <laughs> <laughs>